so today is the day for cardiac imaging and uh, the field of cardiac imaging is really advancing and i would like to share my experience and how imaging can uh, be helpful so all of us know about uh, this mri brain with an acute infarction on the diffusion weighted images and once it shows the hemorrhage the prognosis is different the treatment is different the entire concept towards the patient changes by the clinician similarly the same is true even for the myocardial infection so today i'm going to present a article about intramyocardial hemorrhage and how it happens with a reperfusion injury and how it compromises myocardial salvage it is clinically very relevant and very important to clinician because the entire management and the prognosis is different so this is an article which is recently published in journal of american college of cardiology dr ting liu from hong kong is the main author along with uh, others the article is based about acute myocardial infarction so as we are aware that this infarctions are treated with reperfusion therapy whether it could be pharmacological or it could be post stenting this reperfusion therapy for acute mi is life saving but the benefit of the reperfusion therapy can be paradoxically diminished by the reperfusion injury reperfusion injury basically means microvascular obstruction intramyocardial hemorrhage and all this uh, the pre patient prognosis will be Uh, impaired and also the mi size mi size will also increase so what they have seen that they have studied the cardiac troponin markers that is biomarkers in all those patients with st segmented elevated mi patients once on the ecg you have st segment you definitely know that it is a full thickness transmural myocardial infarction these patients were then classified whether they developed hemorrhage or non hemorrhage non hemorrhagic infarct same thing like how we do it for our brain cases we will discuss about how cardiac mr can differentiate between the hemorrhagic mi and non hemorrhagic mi in this study basically this patients were followed up along with biomarkers along with mri and how they improved on the treatment so the final bottom line is that myocardial hemorrhage is determinant for size of the myocardial infarction it drives the mi expansion after reperfusion and compromises myocardial salvage this introduces a clinical role of my intramyocardial hemorrhage in the acute care management risk assessment and future therapeutics so basically this is about the microvascular lecture of the heart so as we are aware that apart from this epicardial arteries there is significant microvascular uh, micro vessels which are there all throughout the heart once they get obstructed it deals with microvascular obstructions now these areas of mvos can expand up to 48 hours following reperfusion also once they are destroyed they can result into intramyocardial hemorrhage as we are see over here that you know there could be some capillary burst and some rbcs and wbcs which could be going down in the myocardium itself now this intramyocardial hemorrhage will increase the infarction size and it is known that it will uh, exaggerate the microvascular compromise by causing further external compression further vasospasm and thus by extending the zone of hypoxia in case if there is hemolysis uh, there will be some iron which will be released which would be further cytotoxic and this will be again increasing the edema so this all these effects of uh, mvo and intramyocardial hemorrhage are really deteriorating for the patient so as once you do reperfusion whether it could be pharmacologic or post stenting there will be some amount of cytotoxic biomarkers which are already released there will be some high distending uh, intravascular pressure in the distal vessels because of all this there will be bursting of the hypoxic capillary endothelium and which will further lead to intramyocardial hemorrhage so in this study they have studied around 64 patients with st segmented elevated mi all these patients underwent coronary angiography they identified the culprit vessel which was either most of the cases lad lcx or rca all these patients troponin markers were studied before and during the study cardiac mri was performed after 5 days 
and then this uh, myocardial infarction were classified as hemorrhagic and non hemorrhagic apart from this patients they also had a canine model in which they also along with uh, to look for the area at risk that is why they did the dual modality system with uh, integrated positron emission tomography system as well from the cardiac mri all the patients underwent a routine dedicated cardiac mri with cine images late gadolinium enhancement images for intramyocardial hemorrhage t2 star mapping is the modality uh, is a sequence of choice basically it is the same sequence it is a multi echo sequence what we use it for the thalassemia for the iron overload so t2 star is very sensitive to iron so it will be very important sequence to do in intramyocardial hemorrhage all cmr image analysis were per, was performed on a dedicated cardiac mr uh, software processing software they all the mis were identified based on the late cardiogram enhancement images and they were quantified that anything above five standard deviation to the remote uh, to the mean signal intensity of remote myocardium then there was uh, delineated whether there is uh, myocardial uh, uh, infarction with mvo and those patients with mvo who had this t2 star values which were at least two standard above the normal values then they were classified as uh, intramyocardial hemorrhage one other parameter what can help is uh, at least two standard above the, uh, above the t2 star values or basically taking that uh, anything uh, below 20 milliseconds then you know that t2 star below 20 milliseconds is definitely imh so the images were classified whether hemorrhagic or non hemorrhagic mi so all these patients with st segmented elevated mi underwent an angiogram uh, post pci they were classified as uh, infarction with so what you see over here this dark areas are the areas of microvascular obstruction so this is an area of infarct and the mvos were calculated and within this mvo in case if the patient had anything t2 star values with less than 20 milliseconds they were classified as hemorrhagic myocardial infarction again base mid and apical that is why try to taking the entire uh, uh, left ventricle in the short axis views is important non hemorrhagic mi again from uh, uh, taking the short axis views basal mid and apical assessing the late cardiogram enhancement images taking an area of infarction and calculating in case if there is any t2 star values so t2 star values less than 20 milliseconds were classified as hemorrhagic mi while non hemorrhagic mi when t2 star values were uh, more than 20 milliseconds so those patients who developed intramyocardial hemorrhage as uh, it is seen over here so these are the short axis uh, images and you see an area of uh, hyper enhancement delayed hyper enhancement images within this bright areas there is this dark areas so these are the areas of microvascular obstruction as you see over here so in case if this within this mbo if the patient had any values of t2 star values of less than 20 milliseconds this quantifies intramyocardial hemorrhage and then serially this patients were studied over less than one on our 24 hours 2 days 5 days 7 days and 8 days so this patients were serially followed up for the infarct size amount of imh amount of lv function and all other myocardial salvage parameters again this is the t2 star value t2 star mapping is obtained as base mid and apex and within this we can classify and quantify the amount of intramyocardial hemorrhage these are the patients who developed who did not have intramyocardial hemorrhage and as you can see over here that uh, within this these are the areas of late gadolinium enhancement late gadolinium enhancement is seen over here and this areas they did not show any uh, t2 star values of uh, uh, less than below 20 milliseconds and there was no evidence of uh, any altered signal uh, attenuation signal density in this areas so this were classified as the patients who did not have intramyocardial hemorrhage so all these patients 64 patients were studied and followed and this were the few main uh, conclusion or main uh, results what they found they found that all those reperfused stemi patients with intramyocardial hemorrhage had larger myocardial infarctions 
so the infarct size was significantly higher in this group and we can see it on these images as well just look at this bright scar so this is an area and even after 8 weeks the amount of infarction which was present while comparatively in those patients who did not have intramyocardial hemorrhage definitely had a reduced mi size mi size the larger the size worst is the prognosis more is the arrhythmia risk more is the morbidity so the entire management and complications will be increase in this group of patients troponin markers cardiac troponin markers were also significantly high in intra with the patients with imh as you see over here they have a rapid rise and they were still persistently higher even after day 5 or day 7 so all those patients with imh they had significant rise of uh, cardiac troponin markers cardiac troponin that is trop i is basically one of the parameter for uh, uh, myocardial necrosis more is the necrosis the higher will be the values time lapse non invasive imaging shows that the mi size post reperfusion depends on the imh status so even after 8 weeks as we had seen in the diagram the scar size which was persistent was significantly higher in those patients who had imh uh, present in the myocardium so again more is the scar more is the chance of arrhythmia worst will be the clinical outcome so all this is very important for the patients follow up patients who had myocardial hemorrhage they had an infarction which was expanding transmurally in wavefront fashion so basically this is the how the reperfusion uh, injury ischemia and reperfusion will again go and this will be like a time dependent phenomenon and this will be like a wavefront while those patients who did not have imh will have a prognosis like this but here there will be spikes of increase of the ischemia and reperfusion again because of myocardial hemorrhage there will be compression vasospasm and again the ischemia it will be like a vicious cycle more importantly even there is a therapeutic window for reperfusion now what you see over here that once the patient uh, develops a myocardial infarction it is important that the reperfusion is performed within 12 hours if this is the therapeutic window for reperfusion anything below 12 to 24 hours you can see that uh, the myo salvage myocardium Uh, will be significantly uh, reduced so in case whenever the patient develops an infarct the reperfusion therapy should be obtained in this initial few hours more than 24 hours there is no scope for pharmacological or interventional uh, reperfusion and this is how even the mean mi size with uh, normalized to area at risk it is different for the intramyocardial hemorrhage with or without imh now this is an another uh, article how it shows that how reperfusion images so for example that after occlusion this is the area at risk and there is a hypothetical benefit that you know following reperfusion maybe you can you know salvageable myocardium and only this will be the infarct size but actually the real benefit after uh, reperfusion therapy is only this much because there will be definitely some amount of uh, muscle loss due to reperfusion injury so it is always like a double edged sword where you can actually without reperfusion injury sometimes the benefit is more uh, rather than along with reperfusion because it will definitely compromise some amount of myocardial salvage this is the central illustration of this article that how it shows that once the patient gets a myocardial infarction if the infarction is hemorrhagic which we can very well see it on cardiac mr using uh, t2 star mapping values after there will be in case those hemorrhagic mi will have a rapid infarct expansion and uh, then along with that there will be a stable infarction size but you can see the amount of uh, uh, myocardial scar which will be there which is over here while those non hemorrhagic will have only minimal infarction expansion and they also will have a stable infarct infarct size but the amount of uh, infarct size what you can see is significantly different so hemorrhagic uh, mi's post reperfusion the cardiac troponin peak is earlier as we had seen they expand following a wavefront pattern and they are more transmural 
as it is seen over here hemorrhagic myocardial infarctions are two fold larger in size and they have a three fold progressive loss of salvageable myocardium so this is the difference between the hemorrhagic myocardial infarction and non hemorrhagic myocardial infarction which is clinically so important the bottom line of this that once there is a non hemorrhagic infarct there will be some amount of necrosis edema but in the chronic stage it will stabilize to a scar pattern once the patient has a scar which is significantly higher in cases of hemorrhagic myocardium along with some amount of necrosis edema the scar size will be more iron again will be cytotoxic which will be persistent and the edema also will persist for a longer time so the entire prognosis the scar size edema pattern all this will be different from the hemorrhagic and non hemorrhagic myocardial infarction so it is important that we identify this cases of intra myocardial hemorrhage tell the clinicians because depending on that the pharmacotherapy will be different depending on that patient prognosis will be different also important that reperfusion therapy is like a double edged sword it has to be performed within that crucial window similarly like how we do it for the cerebral infarction and everything so similarly the field is uh, we have to be competent enough and tell our clinicians the uh, and explain the prognosis yeah so now i'll move over to the case so basically here i am going to show two different cases of uh, cardiac mr so in cardiac mr whenever you have this viability imaging especially in acute uh, coronary syndrome it is important that we evaluate also for uh, intra myocardial hemorrhage yeah so uh, okay so this was a 54 year old male non diabetic non hypertensive early morning 5 o'clock he had resting angina by the time he reached to this nursing home it was uh, 1 pm and there he was thrombolyzed pharmacological thrombolysis was done clinically he improved ecg showed uh, less than 50% of resolution but however since uh, it was a tertiary he was shifted to a better hospital hospital he reached around 1230 and again he had an ecg reelevation so because of this there was no angina no lvf troponin levels were elevated but this ecg reelevation the and anyway he required a catheter angiography so they perf they went ahead with the catheter angiography this is an ecg where you can see that from v1 to v6 this is an st segment elevated mi so once you have this much st segment elevation you know that this is a transmural scar these are the 2d echo images and you can see over here this part the apical part is not moving so there is a kinesia partly of the septum and all apical segment so this fits into lad territory in fact so this is how the catheter angiography was performed and you can see over here there is a tight stenosis in the proximal uh, left anterior descending artery again if you can see over here there is almost 80 to 90% stenosis in the proximal lad right coronary artery no significant narrowing so since this was a short segment tight stenosis they went ahead with the and he was still in that window period of 24 hours they went ahead with the plasty and stenting you can see the guide wire which is going inside inflating the bulb and putting a coronary stent so this is how a good result definitely the interventional cardiologist will be very happy to see this kind of result post stenting follow up and it can be seen that there is good amount of all the distal vessels are also filling up and the complete opacification of mid and distal lad is seen yeah so with angiography anyone will say it is a very good positive result patient's clinical outcome should be very good this is the post uh, stenting angio but let us see what happened on cardiac mr so again this as compared to this sim similar study the cardiac mri was performed on day 5 after the uh, uh, catheter angiography or stenting was done before the discharge just to prognosticate the patient 
So these are two chamber, four chamber, and three chamber cine images. What you can see over here, as was seen on the 2D echocardiography, there is uh, a kinesia involving all the apical segments and interventricular septum. The lateral wall, inferior wall is moving well. So it is important that you compare all the long axis images. Uh, this is again the anterior wall and apical segments are really a kinetic. And this is the three chamber images. So this is the short axis cinestech images. And uh, since it is an acute MI, there is no loss of myocardium. So hence, there is no uh, thinning what you see in chronic myocardial infarction. But there is definitely a kinesia of the anterior wall, interventricular septum, and all apical segments. Ejection fraction was significantly reduced around 27 to 30%. This is a normal perfusion scan, not an adenosine stress perfusion. This is a rest perfusion scan. And as you can see over here, there is a perfusion defect in the interventricular septum. All the basal, mid, and apical LV segments show a perfusion defect. And this is fitting into LAD territory. This is the strain mapping images for all the novices uh, in cardiac imaging. Uh, basic, uh, this is a CMR strain with feature tracking images. Uh, basically, it is a definitely a better parameter for LV systolic function because on the EF, you are just ex explaining the short axis views. But it is important that we understand about the longitudinal deformation as well. And hence, uh, all the new prognostic markers are based on the global longitudinal strain. So this is a GLS parameter that uh, will be again helpful for the clinician. Parametric mapping. Um, it is important that you do T1 and T2 mapping. T1 mapping is for the fibrosis. T2 mapping is for the edema. So especially in interesting cases, like in this cases of acute coronary syndrome or cardiomyopathy, it is important that we perform this. And again, taking base, mid, apical, three short axis views. And as you see over here, this is a 16 segment bullseye model where each and every segment, whatever is the value, we can quantify. And here, what you see over here that on the native T1 mapping, there is definitely some amount of fibrosis which is set in in the septum and as well as the apical segments. Post T1, for the calculation of this extra corpuscular volume, it is important that we take T1 uh, mapping values pre and post contrast. Now, wherever the contrast has gone, the gadolinium, that part will actually show uh, gadolinium uh, uptake and then it will be reduced signal intensity. But as you can see over here, this part in the interventricular septum is showing increased signal because the gadolinium has not reached there. And which means that there is some amount of microvascular obstruction. T2 mapping values are important, especially for the myocardial edema. And as you can see, there is increased value in the septum. So whenever there is an acute MI, T2 mapping values will be elevated. And the most crucial set of images in any cardiac MR is uh, late gadolinium enhancement images. And as you can see over here, there is a transmural scar involving the anterior wall, interventricular septum, and all the apical segments. So this is a transmural scar, but within this scar, there are these dark areas. So these are the dark areas which are called as microvascular obstruction. So as we had seen in the article, whenever there is a, a significant disease and the microvascular microvasculature of the myocardium gets destroyed, you will have this kind of, it is termed as no reflow phenomenon. So here, basically, there will not be any uh, uh, gadolinium which will be going there. And hence, this will be a microvascular destruction, MVOs, areas of MVOs. And within, you can, as you can see over here, you can see the entire anterior wall, all apical segments, LED territory is completely scarred with large areas of microvascular obstruction and destruction. These are LG images, again, should be obtained in all the planes, all the short axis, four chamber, two chamber, and three chamber. And they have to be scared, uh, seen together all, along with long axis and short axis view, as well as with the CNA images. So as we can see over here, even with the delayed images, there is a persistent area of MVO, which are seen in the septum and apical segments. 
T1 pre contrast and post contrast images but as you can see over here this area is relatively uh, does not take up gadolinium and hence this was suspicious for intra myocardial hemorrhage and hence we evaluated these are the T2 star images the gradient echo images basically taken in basal mid and apical segments and here when we take an roi in that involved area the t2 star values are below 20 milliseconds 9 milliseconds so this is a definitely an area of intra myocardial hemorrhage which has occurred post reperfusion this is definitely a poor prognostic signs and the clinician should be aware this patient should requires more uh, follow up and more aggressive medical treatment so it is imperative that you know uh, the entire prognosis morbidity all this will be different uh, for this group of patients as we have seen in our article moving on to another case this was another patient who presented with uh, uh, chest pain and who developed again the similar uh, infection in the septum and the anterior wall these are the long axis images two chamber four chamber and again the anterior wall is akinetic apical segments lv apex anterior wall is uh, relatively akinetic as compared to lateral wall and this is an area of uh, transmural scar with a large scar of microvascular obstruction as it can be seen over here but again the same led territory in fact with late gadolinium enhancement images but as we see over here when we took this t2 star values and in t2 star values taking the uh, roi putting the roi in the septum area the t2 star values are definitely about uh, 20 milliseconds which confirms that there is no intra myocardial hemorrhage so this patient will have better prognosis as compared to the first one but however still he has a large led territory in fact but the entire pharmacotherapy the entire management the entire prognosis is different something about uh, the area at risk and myocardial infarction as we can see over here there whenever there is an increased duration of ischemia so normally acute mi develops when there is myocardial ischemia which is lasting for more than 20 to 40 minutes but once the ischemia goes uh, for a longer time then the infarct rate myocardium will actually start from the endo subendocardium and that will be the progressing like a wave front to the epicardial layer once you have a complete transmural necrosis ischemia has already lasted for 4 to 6 hours so if this ischemic myocardium is reperfused early that is within 24 hours the degree of myocardial salvage exceeds the necrosis mvo or imh basically they go hand in hand they are closely linked and they often coexist so it is important that those areas of mvo we also do t2 star values and assess for imh why does mvo occur that whenever there is an ischemia there will be some amount of inflammation some amount of myocyte death edema will be there in the adjoining tissues because of this there will lead to endothelial dysfunction some micro thrombi can also go and again which will result into uh, a reperfusion uh, injury and with stenting there will be some embolic uh, emboli which will go into the microvascular uh, or in, uh, microvasculature all this patient would lead to more myocyte death and leading to myocardial stunning and arrhythmia and this will be definitely causing worsening of the ischemic cardiac injury mvo can happen whenever there is a prolonged ischemic injury as we have seen like more than 4 to 6 hours it can also occur because of reperfusion injury as it could be pharmacological or post intervention sometimes because of the distal embolization as we have seen that uh, the thrombus itself can go into microvasculature and cause the mvo or when the injury is so much uh, prolonged and extensive that there is an injury to microcirculation so all these are the causes which leads to microvascular obstruction and uh, it is basically an independent uh, risk factor and there is definitely increased cases of all cause mortality and heart failure it will lead to adverse uh, left ventricular remodeling and poor prognosis cardiac mr basically with multiple uh, 
sequences using late gadol name enhancement images sometimes early gadol name enhancement can be done for the mbo perfusion scan parametric mapping all these sequences probably we can actually calculate the amount of area at risk the amount of infarction microvascular obstruction hemorrhage and thrombus so this is a value of cardiac mr in cases of uh, acute coronary syndrome lastly what we have studied today is about the intramyocardial hemorrhage it is a subset of severe microvascular damage and uh, it is a its presence of imh is a malicious sign because it will lead to severe ischemic injury not in the acute setting but even in the healing phase here this amount of necrotic tissue will be replaced by scar which will be much more in the size and will have a poor outcome simple microvascular obstruction will reduce in size so what you can see over here whenever you have a doubt whether there is a thrombus or an uh, wall adherent thrombus or a microvascular obstruction it is better that you take a delayed images the area of mvos will fill up so there will be uh, some amount of temporal evaluation that uh, you can differentiate whether it is a presence within the mvo apart from that the microvascular obstruction will be within the areas of uh, lge so you have to have a classical lge scar all throughout and within this bright areas you identify this dark areas which will be termed as microvascular obstruction most importantly that how we modify our protocol for whether it is a like it's a cartilage assessment we tell the uh, radiographer to do accordingly whenever there is a tumor we do our tumor protocol so similarly even in cardiac mr every clinical indication has to be studied what is the clinical question and the depending on that your planning and sequences uh, should be done and it is important that we understand everything about the physiology thank you